Welcome everybody to Life with Legends and I'm Justin Bell. Well, as soon as I decided to create this little series, I knew exactly who my first guest should be. And that is, of course, my father, Derek. Mainly because uh, he is an absolute legend of a man, but also because I knew he'd say yes. Five-time winner of the Epic Le Mans 24-hour race and a two-time world sports car champion. He's a man that lived through the most dangerous era of motorsports and helped dominate sports car racing as teammate to some of the other huge stars of the sport. You know, I, when I do an interview, I really have no plan for where it goes, but with a lifetime of amazing stories and memories to share, I knew that it really would be fun to get it down on tape. We talked about his friendship, early friendships with Enzo Ferrari, and also why I got started in the sport and whether he actually even wanted me to do it. But more importantly, I have a, an extraordinary relationship with my father and he's been an incredible role model for me, not just as a race car driver, but also as a man. I'm beyond proud of him. The interview was conducted at Gunner Racing. Our friend Kevin Jeanette, who we both raced for at Daytona, let us hang out for a couple of hours, sitting in front of the iconic, legendary Lohenbrauer 962. That is where I took the portrait, which you can see, uh, which Dad has signed, and they're absolutely beautiful. Uh, but it was a fitting backdrop because these two had a pretty speedy relationship. Anyway, I hope you enjoy it. We're definitely going to have to do a part two because we left a lot out. It's funny with... I guess when late this morning the news of big, you know, like Al, big Al dying yesterday, that's that's where the idea for this came from. It was just like yeah. sitting with you and Jackie X, sitting yeah. and listening to the stories at Lamar, hearing you guys, and then, you know, and there's all the Brian Redman ones that you yeah. know, and then yeah. you read his book and you realize there's so more. And then yeah. uh, I actually said it to Stefan the other day, uh, yeah, Hansen, that, you know, he, he's not a BRDC member, but when you get the BRDC obituary, you go, oh, all these people, it seems to be weekly. You go, fuck! I didn't know anything. Didn't know anything about them. I wish yeah. I'd taken mm. the time to oh, yeah. to know them, right? And it's awful. You go to a funeral and you hear it all. Anyway, without being macabre, that was where the sort of the the inspiration for this series came yeah. from. Was just, yeah. you know, if you don't talk to everyone and get the stories right. down, they're, they're timing out. Yes. You know, it's rather like a life. I haven't really probably ever said it to you, but I've said it to myself and occasionally to other people, is the fact that the, the real story is, where, 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 where did you come from? Mm. And I'm not saying I want you to ask me that, but you know, it's like, well, all you know is what he did when he got into Formula 2 or Formula 1. Well, made it you never heard, how did he get there? Yeah. What happened on the way? What, but, but particularly... Look what, at did I can't, oh, I'm made. No, no, it's perfect. This, look at him. Oh, Kevin. The Kevin. We're at Kevin Jeanette's place. Uh, look, at uh, Ghana. look at him. He's got, he's got cups. Here, you can have the so, golf one. Oh, oh, you I, so good. Got, I, can I had there. coffee in my breakfast one in that. Was Thank you. Like, you are uh, thanks, an amazing, David. man. I'm going to lock this door so no one else crashes. Uh -huh. I don't know. Well. Well, but you know, the, and that, we, if I would interview you, you, but I don't have thirty six. Oh, I don't have thirty six hours. That's a no. That's it'll be a yes one day. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you're right. Where where does everyone? Where does start? It, and and that, that nobody's ever put together, apart from in their almost their obituary. And you go, shoot, I didn't know he did that. Yeah. You think what a pity that we don't know that he actually went in the army, fought in. That's what happens a lot with this generation, yeah. isn't yes, it? That's right. You're going, but what he was in that? Yeah. You don't realise it where they the came Navy from, what they did, all, and it was so interesting. Um, and and I say the, the, there is I've said it to several journalists. There is a book somewhere of where it all starts. Just origins. Yes, yeah, really. origins or something. Yeah. I wonder. I wonder if um, when you're thinking about you know the famous people you know, if there would be a common theme. You know, if you think about it, they, you know, it seems like no. It's like it how did like Brian no, Redmond start? How did Frank Williams borrow his mother's A35 yeah. at weekends and you'd nip off, put roundels on it, and go racing? Yeah. And Brian did a similar thing. Where did Hobbs go? Well, they owned Hobbs Automatic, Hobbs mm. Automatic which isn't perhaps so interesting necessarily because he did it a, a moral way. But I mean, you know, when you think, well, and no, so mine's not that interesting, but there are so many interesting places of, I mean, how did Gilles get here from bloody yeah. Brazil? What spurred him on to come here? Yeah. What brought him here? Was it, was it his money? 
was it a promoter's money? Was it, you know, yeah. what I'm saying? Was he I, think, I often think actually when Aldo Andretti died, I was actually, I never knew him. I met him mm. once, I think. But I was thinking from Mario's point of view, that must have been so sad. The two mm. brothers arrived mm. here with nothing really, right? Yeah. And mm. took on the, I mean, certainly Mario took on the world. Mm. I was thinking that must be, he must have been desperately sad about that. Yeah. But then it made me go, what was it like? And hopefully one day I can interview him for this. What was it like being, um, a young Italian mm. stud with full of confidence and because mm. we only know Mario Andretti as the superstar, as the superstar. Mm. and that's the other side of it I reckon is when you guys started there was no right. no plan well no, I mean was, you didn't know where if, if, you, if you ask nowadays it's going to get a little more dull, more dull because they started in carts at eight years yeah. old yeah. so yeah. everyone yeah. here about 49 races a year and how many firsts they got and how many yeah. right. and, you know, I've been sort of helping this young kid in England a little bit, not physically or mentally, yeah. but his uncle, grandfather came on to me and he's, he's been winning everything in fucking karting for the last year and he's only 12. Amazing little kid by the look of it. But I mean, you go, oh God, you know, what a awful way he's on his way. You know what I mean? I couldn't help it. I mean, he didn't ask me to help, but he wanted me to help put a word in. And I yeah. said, but it, you know, it, his results show, he, it's not as, a lot of people, they put it in, they've never, if only I had the right car, this kid's, yeah. Karting and he's winning yeah. and everything he gets into. But, you know, what more can you say than that? Yeah. For example, but you could later on, but it's not those guys from karting, it's re what, what, you know, what inspired you to drive? I mean, somebody said to me, I think in the last few days, what, why did you, you're on, what was it, so in the last 48 hours, you know, you lived on a farm, what made you become a racing yeah. driver? Well, because Goodwood was up on the hills, I think. I so you really could hear it. Oh, good Lord, yes. Yeah. I could hear every gear shift. Yeah. You couldn't know what it was at first? Um, I did, did, yeah. did No, I, I knew. Did Grandpa say it was... Um, I don't, you know, it's a strange thing. Um, I sort of, I followed racing through my dear father, who worked for the BBC, as mm -hmm. you know. And he, um, well, you know very well, because you spend a lot of time with him, but um, he, you know, used to do outside broadcasts for BBC. And so I went to Silverstone to watch bike racing, can you believe? <laughs> and watch motor, you know, the motor, yeah, yeah. Uh, Jeff, Jeff Duke and people like that. I mean, that goes back till I was 10 or 12 years old. And that's what the first thing I ever saw race was motorbikes race because he used to cover that with BBC. Yeah. And then I remember going around the track one day with he and Robin Richards, who you would never heard of, was a TV presenter, commentator on motorsport. And, uh, and I remember sitting in the middle of an Austin Healy. My dad was on the right, you know, his, left, his right hand drive. He was on the left, I was on the middle, so almost sitting on the gear lever. And Robin Richards drove us around Goodwood at a certain amount of speed, not mm. particularly fast, but I was in a sports car and I was going around, yeah. no you haven't, in a sports car going around Goodwood. And um, I don't think it was Silverstone, I think it was Goodwood. And I did that a few times, uh, once or twice. And that, I mean, so in a way, it was all getting ingrained into my, my head at that point. And of course, then we came down, and I'm talking from when I was like eight or 10 years old. Oh, you see, because I, I thought that, that the only connection you had was when no, your mom divorced and yeah. moved south. No, no. I, so that's interesting. Yeah. So actually, granddad did give the first spot. Yes, he did really, without, obviously without, without, without realizing it. Yes, he wanted me to go in the Navy, <laughs> <laughs> but only because he was. And a very proud man. But that was, yeah, that was in those very early days. And I would say it was in that transition period when they did split up. I wouldn't know exactly when because yeah. I don't think, I'd, I mean, I don't even know when it happened. It, well, it was soon after the war. So it was, I mean, well, we came to Pagham when I was nine years old, yeah. I suppose. So yeah, that I was 1950. Yeah. So mm -hmm. 1950. And um, it was after that. So it was during the period of the, yeah, the transition. split up. <clears throat> yeah. And um, so that's how I first went on a track. And then, of course, the, uh, being at Goodwood and then, uh, well, being near Goodwood, sorry, being in Pagham, I don't know how it would try and, you know, sort of worked that I worked into the car side of things. But I remember, you know, the old man, the colonel, my stepfather would stick me out in the field and say, Harrow, you know, chain yeah. Harrow <clears throat> that field or cultivate or even plough a field or roll it, whatever it happened to be. And I'd just gotten down sort of. He must have been so excited. Yeah, well, I was drive. driving. I was driving at <clears throat> nine years old, so I was driving up and down doing my my work on the farm, and um, I, I, at the same time going up and down. There's not much to think about. No, 
and um, so I used to I used to sort of actually dream about one day driving a Goodwood because when I'd stopped to have my cheese sandwich and a glass of tea or a cup of tea, I could hear the cars or a car going around Goodwood. And, and once I'd been to Goodwood as a marshal with the Bognor Motor Club, which again was when I was 15 and 16, um, I could at that point, of course, I knew the corners and I could tell when they were downshifting for the chicane. I could tell when they were downshifting for Lavins and that sort of thing because I could tell from where we were, probably six yeah. miles away, and they're on the hill, so it sort of bounced down, I think. I, I ne you know, hearing you say it, I never, it just made me realize something. And I must ask Paul Stewart or David Brabham, or any of the second generation guys, um, I don't think, I never had that, because I never, it was always around. So yes. I never, I never had a child, schoolboy curiosity because you were in it because I birth. was in it from birth yeah, yeah. which is kind of sad really I never in a way, I never yes. looked yeah. at it romantically no well, nor did they couldn't have done could they they didn't I in don't the think same they did way, no. no not at all no second whereas generation. Lewis Hamilton looked at it romantically yeah, yeah you exactly. know with and yeah. and but I don't well, if you think about it Nico Rosberg didn't either mm. and I think it showed in the way he was a, he's a great guy but yes. I don't know it was the same passion as if you just looked at autosport and and dreamt about it yeah you know yeah. I, I wondered Quite that's interesting a, yeah yeah it's really different because did you have such a real desire to do it or was it part yeah. of I think I ought to because dad did it yeah or somebody said people ask that you should time. do it because your father's doing it and that would be and you also feel well if he maybe one didn't think about it your yeah you know, move over but into it, but the fact was, you, you, did we look at it and go, well, Dad wasn't a bad driver, so therefore I should have his genes. I don't think yeah. we ever discussed that Never. in that period. It's only later on when you reflect on it and you think, actually, my mother was a really good driver. Yeah. Okay, not a racing yeah, yeah. driver, and um, she was a natural, and I was pretty, pretty yeah. good. My dad, bless him, wasn't. Um, uh, I remember driving to the golf cart. Yes. Even, yes. It, and he'd drive and we'd go up there with Grandjoy for lunch or whatever. Yeah. I remember it was yeah. so slow. Yeah. It was it was yes. so different. That's I right. see, how can he be your dad? That's right. You I know? remember and he said, What car should I get now, son? And I go, I've got to get him out of this old Hillman thing that he had or whatever it was, bless his heart. Because it was such an achievement to yeah. get any car in those days, to have enough yeah. money to buy a car. And I remember I convinced him to get that VW, didn't I? Yeah, he had a yeah, Volkswagen, the, the four-door. No, was not it? the no, Ciroc, no. it was like that. Anyway, it's the four-door yeah. version. And it was really quite a cool car. And he it was sort of it. not my dad's cup of tea, really. Yeah. But I knew he'd like it once he drove it. And of course he did, and he had it all the way That's through. Yeah. yeah. No, I, I think that when people ask, why did you become a racing driver? And they're, and they're like, was it for the money and the girls and the... And the speed and everything, and I've always, I've said, well, it probably was all that. Um, not the money side worked out, but you know the everything else. But I didn't. I always maintained that compared to the people that just read Autosport and dreamt about it, I had a much more real basis of why I wanted to mm. be a race driver. Or the decision was more grave because you. I mean, I remember going into your room and seeing you and mum, you'd be in tears because someone had died that weekend. Yeah. Or you'd come back and you'd be really, really, really sad because someone had died that weekend. And my, the first 10 years of my life, from 68 through, so you had a lot of that. Mm. So for me to want to be a racing driver, I think was more informed than just being a dream. Yes, you know, because, yeah, very much. Because I'd, you took me out of school because mm. you couldn't afford it. You know, mm. all these kind of yeah. things. There's, when your career was down. So I don't think it was romantic at all, um, no. which, which is in a way was a pity. But I, I uh, yeah, I've often thought about that. Why, mm. you know, people will try and put you down as to why when you're second generation, they, they, they do sort of try and put you in a box yeah. and you know think, well, say you you're had, doing he, it for the wrong reason. That's or, right. Oh, you had it made, but you didn't make the most of it because yeah. you actually didn't have to, no. which is an awful thing. Not that I've ever heard anybody say that, no. but I think that's. Well, I think, think there were drives that didn't come my way because people yeah. would say, oh, De Justin's okay, he's Dan mm. Belsa. Yeah, you know what I mean? Right. It's, well, I'm sure that happened. It's, uh, exactly. Did you, here's something I never asked you. I mean, you, you remember that first time at the Nürburgring when, when I drove you around and yeah. you yeah. were, you know, you've told that story a thousand times. Yeah. And you're like, oh, actually, he could, he could do that. Yeah. And I think in motocross I showed 
the yeah. speed too at times. Mm. A lot. A lot. But mm. I, I've spent a lot of the last 10, ten it's like therapy now, um, the, the last 10 years trying to work out why I wasn't better. You know what I mean? Because you do, because mm. I think I was fast enough. Well, you prove that enough yeah. times, I think. But I wonder why, did, as, when you didn't have the dad hat on, why do you think that was? Um, I just think, well, I, I, I told somebody the other day, it, it, you just didn't do the right things at the right time, and I don't think necessarily we guide you the right way. I believe, I look back and you can start back at the day that, remember when Jim Russell offered you the driving, yeah. I said, you said, I've saved the money, Dad. I said, right, we'll go to Jim Russell. Yeah. You'd save the money out working in the market garden at the farm. And then I thought, that's crazy. Why go and spend it at Jim Russell, which is 160, yeah. 170 miles away, when actually, at this point, I'd driven for Ferrari and Porsche, and it was in yeah. the 70s. In fact, probably the beginning of the 80s at this point. Um, what the heck was the point of me letting Jim Russell's instructor, yeah. kit coach, when actually I probably had as much, a lot more experience than anybody there. So that's when we went to, to Brands Hatch. You did do that first, you took me to Donington, and I did one morning with Jim Russell, oh, there. which is where I spent my money. Oh, okay. um, and I just we went didn't up and spend down. all of it then. No, I went up no. and down the straight. Okay. It was like 200 pounds. Okay. And, I did but all you did was go around a cone at the end yeah, and come back, right. and I remember going, yeah, what's this? This? Yeah. this is pretty well, dull. Well, that's right. You know, and you're just trying to gear shift and stuff. Yeah. Still exciting. Well, of course but after that, we well, were Well, like, of course. I mean, I think in, re in their defense, they dare not let half the goons no. that went on the driving school just let them say, go and, yeah, off you go. See yeah. you in a couple, in half an hour, have a run yeah. around. You couldn't do it because the cars went off the road and people got hurt. So they never did that. And Jim ran a very tight show, yeah. ship, as they say. No, I, th I think what, what happened is we went and dear old Bert, we got the car yeah. from Bert Ray because we found you could rent one from him yeah. for the day, which we did, and it, that's where we spent, I'm sure, your that's money. That's where the money went. And uh, it was well worth it, but of course you're out there. You And I'll never forget it, because I had a lap sheet, which I, you know, I remember thinking, I must keep this, because I never kept any of my early records. And I remember I basically recorded every lap you did, and every lap that I recorded, which probably was 99%, yeah. you went quicker each lap. And I thought, gee, that's great. Unfortunately, but you were unfortunately caught up in the main group of the top Formula Ford drivers at yeah. that point. When, for example, Stuart was in that, yeah. he was like a year or two, a year ahead of you. And so he was in a proper car and with all the guys. We didn't realize there was going to be an international or certainly a national yeah. race meeting that weekend. So they were out there on that Monday or Tuesday, which wasn't good for you because you were half the time you had to keep pulling over. So let them by. And I think the, but I think where we went wrong. And it was, I mean, I mean, dear old Graham Burrows came along and he offered to help, you know, so we both pitched our money in and we decided to buy a Ray. And that was the mistake. We should have bought Just a Van Diemen. Bought, we should have bought a Van Diemen yeah. because that was the better car. And I suppose it's naivety. And I, I mean, it's a bit like us way back buying the Lotus 41 yeah. and we should have bought a Bravo. If I bought a Bravo in that year, I wouldn't have had six crashes all over Europe might have done, but I don't think so. The Lotus yeah. at that point wasn't very good. And nobody else ran it apart from the fact the works team, the, uh, you know, the Brabham's are flying, but yeah. I gained a lot of experience. Now in a way, you gained a lot of experience driving the Ray always, nearly always being yeah. behind. And you did a good job. And then if you remember, you went up with then, what do we do now? Go up to Formula 3, but well, that was impossible. We couldn't finance that. And I remember you came out and did the winter series here, which you won yeah. in Formula Ford. Now, you must have been quite good. I'm, I used to be use mm. the term in a small way, quite good. Well, I mean, very good yeah. to come over and win a series in a foreign country on a track you've never mm. been on. Uh, I mean, you had to be all right. You could turn around and say, yeah, but he did a season in the Ray. OK, well, that would have been an advantage. But I'm sure not everybody was in their first no. race of year of racing. Uh, and I think that was the mistake. Then, of course, it was, what were you going to do anyway if you went out of Formula 4? Well, obviously, the answer is you're going to go up to Formula 3. But even then, I think it was something like 300,000 yeah, a year. It was 275. It was a fortune. Yeah. Nobody could afford that. I mean, you no, know, no. I, my house was worth 100,000, and they wanted 200,000 for, for a year in Formula 3, and, and so on. And um, so we didn't do it. And if you remember, I came over to race at Miami Grand Prix, which was in March or April. 
And I remember I, in desperation, I phoned you up and said, get your backside over here, yeah. you're going to drive in the Barber Saab mm -hmm. series because you need to be in something. And you came over and you got a, a hell of a lot, you know, you got fastest laps yeah. Yeah. and you won a race, that wonderful race at Palm, Palm Beach and, and or West Palm. And I mean, you proved that you had the talent. So I, without going through the whole of your career, mm, yeah. we made the wrong decisions at certain times. Yeah. And um, I don't know. I don't know why. I don't know. To, I don't know how who to blame. I don't think it's blame. Me. I think it's kind of we just the bell have, way. Well, I actually, well, I we think didn't we, have the money. That no, which was the bell way. That was the point. I mean, I, I know. You know, I mean, we had Melanie, and she was out doing a horsing, and you know, I, and I, we never earned big money. Yeah. You know, what pathetic money yeah. we got in from anybody in those days. This wasn't like Formula One, or over here in America. No. So I, you know, um, I don't know where you, yeah. you, uh, you just didn't get into the right car. At and the I never right did time. the same thing twice. No. And that was, I think, yeah. you know, two years in Formula yeah. Four. You should have done two years. When you think I was, Fox the Fox Lotus, Lotus, Lotus was, was quite good because when you came back and did the second year, you won both the races yeah, yeah, when you're yeah, on exactly. an invitation. And yeah. remember, you you only beaten. And, uh, I was only beaten by Hacken and Anish, and, and, and they were really. We were running our team out of a barn on the farm yeah. down in Sussex mm -hmm. and they had a sort of a, a really quite a, a, a special team yeah. running for them. And they'd done a thousand races. Yes. You know, whereas yeah. I'd only done motocross. Yeah. No, I don't think it's, it's funny, I don't look at it for, I'm, I, I never really look at it to find an excuse. I just look at it, you know, like mm. you do with the benefit of a bit more age to go, to go, shit, I, you yeah. know, all my friends, it, some of my well, some of my friends obviously didn't make it and they mm, didn't do anything. No. And other ones went on to incredible careers yeah, and you just right. you just try and you try and track it back. But I mean definitely the I noticed that and I don't think I've ever really said it to you, you know, when I was doing motocross, I remember if I'd fall off, I mean I'd suddenly you'd appear from you know, this little skinny kid, yeah. and you'd fall off, and then suddenly you'd appear from somewhere, and you'd pick me up and throw, and put me back on the bike, and off yeah. I'd go. And yeah. I, I loved all that. I, I, that connection was amazing. But then I, in in racing, if I really analyze it, people say, "Was it difficult having your dad as who he was?" And I always say it wasn't. I say it wasn't because I'm mm -hmm. so proud of you mm -hmm. that it wasn't. It wasn't a, an issue. However. When I think about the way maybe I felt about myself and how good I was, mm -hmm. was, was, uh, uh, was different. I don't think I was ever filled with huge confidence. And, I, and that was, that, I mean, this really... Uh, I no, mean, but that's a bell way. Yeah. Yeah, yeah honestly, I, I know you're not, I haven't let you finish. No, but... no, but did you ever stand in the driver's briefing in, in, and go, I'm the best in this room? No, no. You see, I yeah. believe that Raikkonen and Mag, came, yeah. you know, the Magnussons and the mm. the yeah. JJ Lettos and they yeah. they do. They sit there and go, yeah. no, I'm, I'm yeah. better than anyone yeah. in this room. No, I never did. And that, and I, I, when I go, it's strange. Only in the last months, years, the last few years, I look at stuff and I look and go, I must have been quite good if I finished sixth in the United States Grand Prix in a Surtees with a cooking engine in the back of a Formula One car. What would I have done if that had been a new engine like Emerson had? I mean, yeah. I should have been third that day because I'd have just overtaken Rainer Wiesel for sixth place, was pulled away, and, that, and then I had the problem with the nut fell out of it. That engine had been at Lotus and had been in Formula One in the very first year of, in 67 when they started. It then went off and did the Tasman as a two and a half liter engine. Then it came back as a three liter and so on. And I mean, it had been used in every bloody old car that Wheatcroft had, bless his yeah, heart, yeah. who thanked me so much. And, you know, we went in, for example, again, into that race, I think, thought about it lately, the Argentine Grand Prix, because of Frank Williams. And Frank ran the car, the, the March 701. And I had that same bloody engine in the back that, uh, that I had in the US Grand Prix in, 60, seven, in 1970, when I finished six, running with a bolt out of the clutch, and that thing was shuddering. And I got it home in six. That engine um, I then had, as I say, later on. And you, you're going, it's still, a, that engine was still around, you know, and there's no way that in the a Grand Prix, uh, it wasn't a full Grand Prix, it was non-championship. Rolf Stomlin was leading in, I don't know what, maybe a Surtees. And I was driving the 701, which was never that good a car. But at that time, at that, for that race a year, it was a year older. It was quite good, but I had the old cooking engine again. Yeah. 
which had been in, and it, it then went, it then did Le Mans as well. And so that sort of thing, and you're going, you know, if only that had been a top engine. And so you, yeah. you look, oh, what a shitty result. I came third, I came sixth, or whatever it was. But when you look back and think, I must have been quite good to drag that car around yeah. and make yeah. it do that. Okay, that's enough said about what I thought. But I think I, sh I, I was better than I thought. I think you, you were better than You wouldn't than be at Ferrari. How your, could you be at Ferrari with the choice of all the drivers in yeah, the world? that's right. And I they, mean, that's what you have to yeah. think, isn't it? And they had X, and they had... Chris Amon, and they, and then they got, you know, then they, of course, they had Regazzoni, yeah. and I was in that mix, and you know, I've, and on a good I've day, not, you could be anyone. I was on pole in my first race at Monza, yeah. the Lotteria in Formula Two out of fifty cars, but anyway, I'm not talking really about me, but I, I think well, we trying are. to relate yeah. our, yeah. I'm not meant to be. I'm talking yeah. about you, with you, yeah. with you, about you and us, but um, uh, you know, things just we didn't make necessarily the really the right decisions, but. Would I have driven anything else if I hadn't driven that Surtees with the yeah. old cooking engine and finished sixth? It was too big an opportunity. I remember dear old, I shouldn't say that, my dear friend Joe Siffert, who I didn't get to know very well, just half a season before he died. And Joe used to say, because we were in the sports car, the 917 together, and he'd say, so what are you racing next weekend at the Grand Prix? Because it was alternate weekend, yeah. Grand Prix, then six sports car. And I said, I'm not racing. He said, I said, I, there's a couple of cars I've been offered, but I don't know if I really need to. He said, drive anything you can. Is that what because there's always the chance you might be out there, piddles with rain, so it doesn't matter how good your engine is, it's how good you are. Yeah, yeah. For example, it never actually happened yeah. like that, but that was what he kept saying. Wow. So he kept going, well, that is a chance. And so I took those chances. And... Um, I, I don't regret it because it, when I reflect, I've had almost a wonderful yeah. career for me. But I'm also, if I'd really done well in F1, which I still think I could have done I that Martini drive if I'd driven with Carlos Reutemann. I mean, he won Grand Prix, and i pretty damn convinced I was quicker than Carlos mm. because I used to beat him in F2 all the time. So I would have done the same in F1 because it's basically just a faster yeah. car. And so similar. I mean, the handling was just the same, yeah, just more yeah. horsepower. Yeah. And Carlos was so good, and I never got the drive because of circumstances. And he's gone on to, to be a legend in that. Bloody tech yeah. But that's the way racing went. So you sort of you do this all through your career, and yeah. I think you had a similar thing. To yeah, be honest, yeah. we just didn't make the right decisions, and I often reflect on that and regret it. But we, you got what we could afford to do. Yeah, I mean, I we got that money out of Camel. You know, it was amazing. From really, come 150,000 pounds, I think, or 100, or whatever it was, to come and do the series, you know, in the Vauxhall Lotus, and we had two yeah. beautiful-looking cars. And my 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 real regret about that period into the next one was uh, was that I I didn't realize how you should what you needed to do to prepare to be a young driver. Because remember, we were I was ahead of there was no triathlons mm -hmm. that the drivers were doing i mean right. you know you i mean everyone always talks about you being incredibly fit but you were just really healthy yeah. you you didn't do triathlons you no, never no. did you i know, just you played were, rugby and you hockey played, you and were fit tennis you were squash. fit and strong yeah. that's what it was yeah but the drivers fit. now are you know it's it's extraordinary so but <laughs> i i should never i mean i was running the business yes. at 19 yeah. 20 years old uh, doing yeah. while my friends were were training or staying, going mm. to the racetrack to to do stuff, to be or mm. driving days or something. I was doing the VAT return for Graham. You yeah. know what I mean? And yeah. I, I remember, I look back on it, I go, that's just crazy that yeah. I, that I was so a, it's not a bell thing to do, mm. and b, I should have just been focusing on driving. Yes, you know, but you couldn't afford. I couldn't not afford to. not. To. And <laughs> you know, anyway, it's just. It, I think it's more the chances. You regret the chances you didn't get, or mm. the decisions you made mm. out of the car mm. but equally in the car you i i realize now that the multitasking i tried to do of having businesses and because yeah. i had to i couldn't afford to live no. uh, were not conducive to being behind the wheel i needed to be more immersed yes. uh, you know and it wasn't our, it wasn't yeah. the way so so i don't i mean you look back and you go how the fuck did i get into that you know how, the the Le Mans car. how do we do that i mean mm. how did the mclaren thing uh, weirdly enough james yeah. If you actually think about it, he got me every single fucking drive I had. Yeah. You know, my best mate, James Guess, he, 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 he found Moody. Mm. He, I met that other guy. That's how that all happened. Yes. Okay. You know, um, and then he found Arika. 
Yes. I mean, actually, a hell of a lot to thank him for. Yes. Um, but he was that sort of person. Yeah, he was a hustler to get it done. Yeah, it was amazing. Um, I remember talking about memories. With Le Mans in '92, when when the first time I pulled out of the pit lane in that uh, in the not one of those it was nine five Richard nine, Lloyd Richard Lloyd nine, six, yeah six. the orange one uh, the ADA car it was the most extraordinary moment of my life to pull out of the pit lane having watched you pull out of the pit mm. lane all those years mm. I remember I literally remember the light the the fl guy waving the flag and yes, driving yes, out yes um, and I remember so much about about that race yes. and. You know, we were, it was never supposed to do anything. Was well, we it? thought but it was going to be dry, do you remember? Yeah. So we made it, took all the wing out of it. I know one might say, well, you could spend five minutes and put everything yeah. back to wet setting, but there wasn't really a wet no. setting. That was a problem. Yeah. And of course it rained and it was a nightmare. That was a horror show, really. I, I mean, I remember when, when you got out and it was raining and uh, it was, I remember going down the straight and, uh, you couldn't see out of the front windshield. Mm. You just was a white, yes. white thing. And I remember looking out of the side window. You're still going just as fast. Because I asked you how fast do you, how fast do you get? I mean, how do you do? You, are you still flat out down the straight? I mean, how should you manage it? And you're like, it's still flat out. I mean, the downforce mm. will take care of you. And but you couldn't see anything. No. And I remember looking out the side window, going, God, this is this is a bit yeah. of a leap from Vauxhall Lotus. Yeah. Um, and it. then when I came in, we had a problem <clears> at one point, and you and Tiff were in the trailer which is never a good sign i remember mm. you said something like when all three drivers are in the yeah. motorhome together we have, a problem. It, we have a problem but they were doing something on the car mm. and you were like god that was terrifying and at the time i thought it was the most fun i'd ever had yes was that yeah. the one where i i think that i mean it wasn't the mclaren i think it was when because we, that was pissing rain too yeah. but i know one of them and i've told the story but i mix it up sometimes is that i remember i got out of the car and you got in and you looked at me like like dad what what do you recommend I, and i looked at you and thought how can i tell him how wet it is on eight miles i thought i can't no. so i just shut the door I know. no it was, that was the 962 that was the night yeah like it was the first time out in the building and i went i can't tell him and, my, and i remember i was glued to the, the you know the yeah. telemetry or whatever for the whole of your yeah. hour and a half the Atlantic, very relaxing <laughs> no, i i i remember the uh i remember thinking afterwards what it must have been like for you you get out of the car as a you're in the car as a racing driver and on your own which is a singular mm. exercise isn't it it's just you doing what you do and then when you got out and you watch me get in suddenly you're a father which is a total literally you're but you're a father with lad. a professional yeah. side of things and you know so you know exactly what i'm about to go and through to live through yeah hopefully yeah, yeah. and that was astonishing one. that was were you ever worried for but me, bloody sure I think, Yeah. Oh, it's awful. Yeah. Well, it's here yeah, having said, people always say you never slept through the whole of Mont. Well, I certainly didn't that year. <laughs> no. But yeah. I never did. But I couldn't relax at all. No, I couldn't. I mean, I wasn't. I wouldn't say I, I was watching old times in the least because you don't watch times no. at Le Mans because it's so varied in the piling rain. But it was just the fact: did you go by each time? Yeah, it was no, such a relief. And of course, it's actually. When you actually stand in the pits at the mall and look out, it's actually quite calming because they all go wow. Yeah. Yeah. That constant kind of sort of drone, really. so there's no sort of wheel spin and no. that sort of thing. I mean, it was it was pretty treacherous out there, but you made it round and around and around. It was crazy, really. Yeah, I'm glad I think we, and, and I can't. I know the McLaren. We all spun at least once. Yeah. and you this freaked out the thing in the night, which I've used. You know, I said to people when you. When the car suddenly goes out of control in the wet for no reason at all, which it is a reason, it's because it's too yeah, wet, yeah. and I, it, because you cannot explain that if you go round and there's a car fifty yards in front or hundred yards in front, you're going to run in his tracks. Mm -hmm. You could run round the next lap in the same part of the track, but nobody's been through it for twenty yeah. seconds, yeah. and the water's come back, and now it's an inch deep, and you can't, you don't know what it is until you arrive. Yeah. And uh, you suddenly have a lurid moment, and you, sp I mean, you, you freaked yourself out. I went, I went on at the, the end of the Mulsanne Strait, yes. and then I went round the roundabout, yes. the wrong way, and the police had to, you know, because I oh, went I on, really, and right. I went through the, to stop. I had to get to the yeah. barriers, yeah. and then I couldn't back out, yeah. so I went round the little roundabout there and we and then we joined and the gendarme's like what the fuck have you come from you know what i mean he's like yeah. looking at me like that and then i and then yeah. i rejoined yeah. and that was uh diana because i remember i remember there's a moment when leto came past us for the lead 
and the first time. Oh, wait, the first, did they, I did. I can't remember him. No, it was overtaking us. He wasn't for the no. lead. He was so over. I we didn't think ahead. he was ever in front until no, we ended right up with that end. problem. Yeah. He was, so he was overtaking. But I remember we were at the end of the Mulzan, and I know he was J.J. Leto and all that, but I remember that our tires would lock up as soon as yeah. we went over the, As soon as you touched them in the wet, they'd just lock yes. and start locking. And he was 100 meters, yeah, 100 yeah. meters later on the Michelin. Those dear old Michelin. And I'm like, like, I'm like, I know he's J.J. Leto, but I'm not that bad at braking. No, you know what no, I mean? I was exactly. like, this... These are two equal yeah, you've cars, been out there too long, already. too long, and I'd raced it all yes, year. Yeah, many, so yeah, I, many times. You know, so I, yeah. I, it was, yeah, that was, that was quite a, that was a I extraordinary yes, experience to yes. get to the end of that race. Yes, it was. And if we had won it again, but I think my career would have changed if we'd actually won Le Mans. Yes, yes, it would have been a, yeah. it would have been a, a bigger deal. Um, but and. And of course, the history books never say right. who did what and what did no. who and who was fastest and who no. wasn't. It's like sort of you. It's just always a deal. Nobody really. You know what I mean? You know, you. All you, I can tell you is one of the guys because you were, you got out of the car or Dave Price, I think, quite correctly kept you out yeah. in the through the darkness in that position because yeah. you you were good. I, I wasn't doing well. I, no. I, yeah, I, but you you had I your had moment got, and that was it. Yeah. And you were never going to get over that until no. it dried out or became daylight. Yeah. And Dave kept you out very wisely, and uh, did, I mean, none of my yeah. fair, I didn't no, really know the right at that point. But um, the fact was that once you sort of got out there again, you started to go really well. Well, at dawn, and, I was really good. Yeah, well, that's right. And then one of the other guys that worked on the team, it wasn't Dave, it was one of his team of guys. Yeah. And he said to me on more than one occasion in the last 20 years that your drive at that time was fantastic. Oh, that's good. Yeah, when yeah. The, he said if there was that, and he said it to me when somebody said, well, you know, it's an event, not about how well did Justin yeah. go, but you know, it's like, yeah, but he freaked out, didn't he? When he spun, I said, well, everybody goes, yeah, bloody right, you would. Yeah. And quite wisely, Dave kept him out. And then, and then this chap just said, let me just tell you, he said, I was on timing and scoring, yeah. and Justin was so fast in that, yeah. it was that transition dawn, period. It was that transition. It was when you got back in. It was obviously it, drying out. And it was drying out, and late. the light was coming yeah. up. And I got the fastest lap of the race, I think, in the yeah. car, actually. Yeah. It, the, the, I think, or oh, the fastest we'd done at that point, obviously, yeah. it had been pissing been rain. The time. But, um, Excuse me. And I remember it was, if it wasn't for that stint, I would have had a really. Yeah. Uh, I would look back yes. at the race with yes. with a very different. Yeah, but we were eyes, never going to win. I felt like I'd let you all down. No, you know? um, the least. And then the we got thing, back in. You have to realize that Le Mans is the team effort. Yeah. And nobody ever. I mean, if you spin, you spin, and you could spin because somebody else yeah. made you yeah. spin. It could have been a tire deflating. Who knows? But what you had was it was just a sit con conditions, yeah. and we all in we all spun at some point. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I remember going off the road and round on an exit, I think at like yeah, Arnage, yeah. and sort of went out wide there. And when I didn't spin, but we were whoa, that was close because you, you were, we were leading the blasted race. I know. You know, I know. what I mean? It's on the same lap as the car behind. I know. And 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 I didn't realize it was the factory car, which of course you know I got into trouble with afterwards from Ron, but. I never knew, I just knew it was a bloody quick, and I didn't yeah. know. But, um, it, no, I, I mean, yeah, it was such a pity, but then Still it's better to be on the winner's rostrum in third place on Father's Day than it is yeah, to no. be fourth. It was still amazing. Yeah. I remember you standing there, and you, I was, and they were all shouting, I say this a yeah. lot at like dinners and stuff, and yeah. they, I could hear 70,000, 75,000 Brits, and yeah. you're looking down, and um, I don't know if I ever told you this, but we used to, stand right by the corner of the building yes. there and the old rat <clears throat> pits and you obviously the old podium was mm, different sure things and then but i remember we were across you would always somehow we would feel i would feel that you caught our eye mm. even when you were up there it was yeah. like i'd seen you see us and i remember thinking to myself that's impossible how can you do that and when i was up there i looked at the corner of the building and i could see James and yes. Sarah and oh, no it wasn't yeah she was no she wasn't around whoever was my girlfriend at the time um you know it, they're on the corner, yeah. you know, Melanie, and I was like, that's incredible, yes, there's 100,000 people down there, and I, yes. and they were shouting your name, they were shouting bell, there about, you know, all that. and I thought, well, bell part still yeah, counts, so, yeah, so I went, you, you said to me, soak it in, I mean, make the most of it, and yeah. I remember I put my hands on the railing, and then look, felt, looked down, and I thought, this is just the most extraordinary yeah. ex 
feeling to yeah, amazing. It's no wonder and you've done it five times you know that's yeah, well when you do it once you think I'm never going to yeah. do this again yeah. well I didn't think I would yeah. and then three years later I won it with the Vipers yeah and so you're up there that was, so but it was go. not quite the same no. as being third overall in, no, you know, with you no, it was, but no the, the excitement was, was a more limited um, yeah. um, um, just a different experience I mean it was still amazing to of course in that it. car bloody hell yeah. I mean it was that was fast an animal, animal. Yeah. it was an animal and it yeah. led to you know five really uh, good years that's something interesting that got. suddenly just went off that's very interesting I wonder why that did it hold on um, shouldn't do that uh, there you go. There it goes. Whatever that Maybe was. just timed out. Um, it's a one man band here. Uh, I was also thinking about, I mean, I'll change the subject, but you mentioned Frank Williams. And yeah. I realized when I was reading all his stuff, and then you said on the phone, you yeah, was reading his obituary and you know, comments from everybody. Again, we only knew, the rest of the racing world only knew him when he was Frank Williams. Oh, man. Yeah, yeah. But you knew him when he was. With on, nothing. on his way, yeah. where we were all together on yeah. our way. Now that was the thing about that era, and I sort of put in the Octane article just a little bit about it, but of course so restricted on yeah. words and room. Um, but I mean, i never forget that era, because I, I was, I'd done my Lotus 7 year and moved up to Formula 3, but of course, rather like you, we didn't have a new one, we had an old one yeah. with an old engine, but it was better than not having a car to race in Formula 3 because we could not afford or absorb the fact that it would cost three times as much. And we didn't have the Cosworth engine, which was 650 quid for the real proper engine, which F3 had that year. We had our cooking engine that we'd built on the farm, which is awful yeah. to say, but it was a, you know, a, a, it was a Ford, a Ford Anglia engine or whatever it was, I don't know, 1000 cc engine. And, um, you know, we built it with, it was just not there. Anyway, it was nevertheless a great learning experience. And having said earlier, well, did you make the right decision? Well, we certainly didn't either. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. I always thought that from what I learned, I'd make sure you didn't. And in yeah. a way we didn't, we never got a bad car for you. It just, yeah. some cases, it wasn't quite yeah, good. as good as it should yeah. have been, but money dictates what yeah. you do. And, um, of course we, there we, you know, we're in that era. And of course went up into F3 with our cooking car, with our own little engine mm -hmm. in the Lotus 31, which was the old, the previous year's car, Rod Banting's old car. And of course I go out there in my first race meeting and I win it at, Ma at Mallory Park. I wasn't accepted at Brands Hatch because I was who the hell's Derek Bell, so they didn't accept me. I went to Mallory on that same day and won the race <laughs> and finished third in the Formula Libre race. So I was really rather chuffed. Then, of course, Brands Hatch said, come back and do the race mid-January because the snow. we would now realize who you are. I went back and had a good race. But we raced through that year with that dear old banger of a car. Yeah. But it was a great experience. But the guys that I had to contend with at all the British meetings, I didn't go out of, out of Britain, were, ended up being Piers Courage, Jonathan Williams, Charlie Lucas, who owned the team, Roy Pike. I mean, what a group, and Pete Gethin, if I didn't mention him. What a hell of a group and of people that were in it and John Cardwell and I mean, all in Brabham's of course. Anyway, that was, and you looked at him at whoa, and they were going through, I mean, they'd pass me going into, into, into Beckett's at Silverstone and they'd be on opposite lock and going, good God, have I got to drive like that? Yeah. And, and the next year I am doing exactly the same in the similar car and finishing in the top yeah. three nearly all the time and became the leading driver in Europe in Formula 3, British driver. And, um, but I realized that, you know, I had the right equipment. It was then that I met Frank Williams hmm. and Frank was one of that group, but he didn't drive with them, but he used to supply them with a lot of the kit that one couldn't get. And Frank was there right at the beginning. And it was incredible because us lot, and I don't miss him in me, but I was sort of on the edges of the group that Reese started racing for young people yeah. because before that it was Formula Ford and Formula V and that was it. There was hardly yeah. any Formula 3. And that sort of thing, and, and 500s, which Sterling did, and Jim Russell, and people like that. But suddenly, Formula 3 was something else. And that's how we sort of really got going. And those guys were the, were the, were the nucleus of what produced Formula 3, yeah. which went on for, for 20 years. And Frank was part of it. Um, he knew the guys. I mean, Frank was a terribly well spoken guy. I think he kept, I have a feeling he came from Nottingham area. I'm not sure. And I mean, I mean, he, you know, he used to take borrow his mother's Austin 30, A35 to go off for the weekend with his girlfriend, and he'd put the rounders on it and take the, <laughs> take the, the you know, the rim embellishers off yeah. and go off and race it. I don't think he ever actually damaged it much, but 
I didn't know about that, but then he was in F3. But Frank was sort of the beginning of the wheeler dealer thing. And he, anyway, so, he, you know, suddenly, oh, you want some special, you want the special, that new air box? Yeah, well, Frank can get you that. And Frank could get everything for everybody. So he became the guy that supplied everything, really, if they wanted it. And then somehow, because England really was the home of Formula 3, I would say, yeah. because that's where the cars were built, Lotus and Brabham, and you name it, they were all built in Britain apart from Techno, which was down in Italy. Um, but the engines were built at Cosworth as well. And also there was the other one, the can, I just had, I'll think of it later on, there was another engine that was built in England. And, and um, so that was the home. And Frank, of course, was doing deals with people all around Europe. Because he was a good dealer. Really. Very good. Yeah, but everybody loved him. He was yeah. so enthusiastic. I mean, that guy worked every hour that God made. That's what they say. Every, yeah. Everyone has said that. Yeah. He just oh. worked at it. He worked at it. He never stopped. That was him. He drove in, and I didn't know what he was driving to get to eventually. You know what I mean? He's not like, hey, Frank, why are you doing all this? I mean, yeah. what's the end product? He didn't know, but he was just wanted to get out there and make a mark and make money. And I think he wanted to race. And uh, then, as I say, he did come to that, I swear he came, well, I know he did, but I think it was at Alton Park. Uh, I think it was in 67, but I might be wrong. But I think he turned up in 67 when I was doing, I think I won the race book at Alton Park um, that year for some reason. Um, and one of the better ones I won. But he, I swear he was there and he turned up, did, I didn't even know he drove. And he turned up and off the so somebody said, Who's that? And he said, Oh, that's Frank Williams. He's bought his brother. And it was in two colours because I think the top was white and the bottom was grey because no, it just still been the prime yeah, paint. Because yeah. you had the bottom panels and the top panel. And Frank raced, and I don't think he finished, but if he did, I mean, he was, he suddenly got, Oh my God, Frank in a car, heaven help us. Yeah. And he was quick, but he wasn't in the yeah, top. He's, bit. He found what but he was, he was good. To do. And uh, that, but I just remember racing against him. So that's when I know I knew him at that point. Mm. And then gradually, as time went by, I got to you know to know him a lot better. And then I couldn't tell you. Well, I know it was seventy or seventy-one, maybe. I drove. Um, you know, I've been in Formula One bit with Ferrari, and I remember I drove for Frank, as I mentioned earlier, in the Argentine Grand Prix in the March seven hundred one. That was Tom Weecross, because Tom had befriended me and was financing my Formula 2 program yeah. in 1970, that's right. And so Frank, Tom had this old cooking engine that I've mentioned, that is what I drove in the Grand Prix as well that year, at, at, in the Surtees car. And uh, when I think, actually beginning of 71, I drove the 701 with that engine in the March. But I drove in 1970 in the Surtees and finished sixth in the Watkins Glen, mm -hmm. United States Grand Prix. Yeah. That was in that with that same dear old cooking engine we had yeah. which served me well and um but during that time frank was sort of gradually making, making his, his team win so he was taking over running cars for people and he just knew how to get around i mean he you know as i say he was still doing his wheeling yeah. and dealing and you know taking his mae cosworth engines yeah. into sweden and norway and out in scandinavia and he had a vw pickup Right, just like the one yeah. we saw just now, but the much newer one than that, obviously not 1949 car, truck. And you had a flatbed on the back, and then you know you'd have um, sort of a tonneau cover over the the, the, the part the cover. Yeah. Uh, the, the, sorry, the, the 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 storage part. And Frank would have a, you know would have an ME or two Cosworth engines in there, taking them to Sweden, and you'd cover them in Christmas trees. So, so you'd, get, <laughs> so you'd, no get, you'd get to the borders and drive across the borders. So the story goes, and I'm sure he did. I'm sure. Stories didn't come it, from nowhere. It was so, it was so, um, that whole era was so pioneering, really, because yeah. there was no point of reference for it. No. Right? There was no, no it, was there just, was, it was just, everyone was, was improving and improving the cars were getting the faster and they... And then bringing in more sponsorship, you yeah. know, in which his case he managed to get money and I drove for him in the March Formula 2 car, Pesco drove yeah. one, I drove one, the Politoys car. And uh, I just remember having that incredible race at, I got on pole at Nürburgring. I mean, I never could win there, but I was on pole time. I had the lap record and everything in Formula. I was the first person under eight minutes in Formula 2 and which means nothing these days yeah. but it was also a slightly different track then yeah. uh, you know there wasn't sh it was shortened a bit now and it, yeah. it was not it was really bumpy in those days and um and you know it, it, it 
I was on pole position and of course leading the race. And I got this fantastic picture. It's about 50 of us snaking down the back of the, behind the pits going down the hill. And I got like 80 yards on, I guess, Ronnie Peterson and Sever and uh, Fittipaldi and all this crew. And I led for five of the 10 laps. And I was, I wouldn't say I was going to win it. It was going to be bloody close um, because these other guys. Stacking were, up behind. Well, they weren't stacking up behind, but the fact was those guys at that stage were improving much quicker than I was. Yeah, yeah. You know, I've been in Formula One, I've done a bit of this, so uh, people expected me to be out there in a way, but they expected Fittipaldi to do something particularly yeah, yeah. special, and then they expected, you know, something else to happen with, um, you know, people like, like, like Ronnie, you know, because he had to come from somewhere. Yeah, I'm just gonna, do that. that's okay. weird. But just to finish that, yeah. so, yes, and so, um, and of course, halfway as I went down to Adenauer Bridge, suddenly I noticed the oil pressure. I was always watching my instruments, and I saw the oil pressure drop, so I switched mm -hmm. off. And to this day, I never found out whether I did. I know I saved the engine, but I wondered if it really was it. Gone. But Frank never said to me afterwards, you bloody idiot, what did you stop yeah. for? The gauge had gone wrong. But I pulled out, yeah. of course, and poor old Ronnie went off the road, avoiding me as I sort of, the engine, as I backed out of it. Well, that twisty bit. And then um, Sever One was pronounced yeah. as sort of the new, the star the of the star. future. I was, um, it was just uh, two thoughts were coming to mind then, because driving around Europe when you're young and racing is the most, going to the racetracks, even when I was doing it in the Vauxhall Lotus thing and we'd take off, it was so, that was a romantic side. Yes, there was yes, something yes. Like turning up in a new town yeah. and, <clears throat> you know, your little band of guys, yes. you'd still hang out and you'd yeah. do stuff and, um, I'd like to think they do now at certain races, you know, I think yes. the drivers do a little if there's in Japan or something, yeah. but back then there was, it was much more collegiate, wasn't it? There was a lot more, you, you did yeah, things camaraderie. together, camaraderie. Yeah, well, you sort of had to. I mean, we'd always have a, this is the thing, always had a, I never get it, I say always, I would say 75% of the time we always had a party on the Sunday night. Did you? <clears throat> well, once, we all drove there, not people didn't come and in you, their private and, and you were alive. That's right, yes, we yeah. were And you'd all have a party, I'll never forget, we went, Bill, Bill Ivey, okay, he was the motorcycle world champion in yeah. like 250s, yeah. and brilliant. He was only about four foot six, but he wasn't, he was very short, like yeah. what typical motorcycle guy, I mean, brilliant young guy. And I'll never forget, he turned up at Monza and he's had, for his for Formula 3 or Formula 2, really, Formula 2 probably, and he turned up there because he, on our siding out of bikes for the moment, as we're doing it as well. And he turns up and he had a white helmet and he had painted a black pipe on it at the beginning of smoking pot. Yeah, yeah. You know, and Bill, he did that and he wondered why they whisked him away to check him over. You know, That's they whisked so him funny. away to the <laughs> medical center before <laughs> yeah. the race started to check he wasn't what I was But we had to live with that. And I'm, I'll never forget when he came back to the hotel and he had a, he had a Maserati. Um, car because he had loads of money. We we're all pa paupers driving yeah. our own trucks, you know. And he sort of would, he had his Maserati there. And I remember we went to the public at the Santa Storgio, I'm sure that, because that's where we always stay, <clears throat> just over the walls behind Monza. And uh, he came back there and we we're on the Sunday night for the party. And, and you know, everybody came back there and yeah. ate there. And, I, and he came and he had his four doors open, or the two doors on his Maserati open. He had quadraphonic. And he had the music full blast, really? and there was a pond there. Yeah. And we all thought the pond was like about two foot deep. It wasn't. It was flat four inches. And guys, guys started diving in it, and it was awful. All the fronds, all the, all the greenery came out, and there were fish floating around on the road. And <laughs> it was. I mean, those sort of parties. We had some great. We had some wonderful. Who, who was the funnest? How did, who well, was the one leader was, of the pack? He led Billy, the pack. That was Bill Ivy that night. He. Yeah. He just had, he was just he was on it. And then of course, bless his heart, he gets killed when a chain seized or fell off the bike oh. in the middle of a race in Czechoslovakia and he died. But and we talk about it so glibly, don't we? But then that was it. But that, we had lots of great events after, obviously not yeah. before, but afterwards. I'm sure. And I mean, I remember we stayed at Caserta, me and the, bless his heart, my stepfather, the Colonel, yeah. without whom I'd never have got anywhere. And, um, and Rollo Fielding and his wife, and he was Viscount Fielding. It's very much like this, but what a lovely guy. I believe he's still around. I haven't seen him for 25 years. And he hadn't, couldn't find accommodation, so he shared our room. It was me and the, my stepfather, the Colonel, and Rollo and his wife. 
And I seem to remember the story where actually, in fact, the old man said, what were you up to last night, Rolly? He took his wife into the shower so he could have a bit of sex. He could have a bit. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> yeah, it was a little... Well, well we were in bed. What, well, you were in bed? I thought I was asleep. Well, I was. No, I remember... I, I, but it must be, I mean, there was... Uh, Jackie said to you last week, last year, two years ago, <clears> when we were all having dinner on that Friday night, um, you know, his typical Jackie smile, you know, I'm glad there was no social media, Derek, yeah, when right. we were, no one knew what you were doing. We didn't know what you were doing. Yeah. The world, I mean, I think yeah. that's why the behavior was so yes. kind of appalling, really, because it was like being a rock star. Yes, I mean, well, it was. And they, but it was appalling in that respect, but it wasn't. It was just the way it was. It was. I'm not saying it was appalling. No, yeah, I mean, I know, ways, but, but, yeah. but that's the way it was. It was I mean, yeah. whether you're a movie star or you're a football player or a soccer player or a cricketer, everybody had fun yeah there's nothing rotten about it nothing illegal basically it wasn't illegal immoral or fattening it was just bloody good fun. it was just fun wasn't it yeah. So, yeah. yeah did you um you mentioned Severe and rodriguez and everyone they're they're such famous names mm. now yeah. but at the time how who was the one or i mean who did you like the most and who was like god he's he's my friend i i really like him and the other part of that was who did you go, holy shit, that is a different level of talent. Yes. I know Jackie was when you got to these cars, yeah. but before that... He was like, he was, he was, that's why I... I so I, there I, was that like, was Well, he, I'll go about Jackie. To start yeah. with, I could talk for ages about Jackie because I, I learned so yeah. much from him. I really did. I learned a lot about Jackie, how to, yeah. It, 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 yeah, you know, how to handle yourself. Although I didn't study him, I just... Yeah. I, when you're young like that, you go, oh, I see, okay, that's how you talk to Dr. Yeah, Porsche or yeah. whatever it was. And you see the respect that he, the people held for him and how he respected their their passion and their love mm. for, for him and the cars. Yeah. So I would I'll follow along. And I wrote a note the other day in that book to him I told you about, and I just said, thank you very much for being sort of my guiding light because although he didn't know it and I didn't realize yeah. it was, and I learned how to handle myself. It was a different thing with Stuckey. We were already up there in in, sort yeah. of the, in our career, in our sort of, if the word's fame. You were established. We really? were established, yeah. thank you. And um, so, uh, you know, Stuckey and I just got on with it and had a hell of a good time and we laughed and we had a great... Jackie was very different. Yeah. Jackie was somebody I respected from the time I drove a Ferrari and he was just like, I mean, He's the ground star. shook when he walked through and everybody bowed and scraped. Really? Like they knew who the hell I was. I mean, I was just another tosser that was hoping to get a drive or be drive for them until I went to Porsche and then that day. But even then, I mean, the newspapers, for example, the headline of the newspaper when we sort of won in Holland or we won in France, it would say X wins and Derrick Bell has a fine race. And you go, hold on, I was in the same bloody car. <laughs> yeah, you know what I mean? Exactly. I didn't expect any more, but it would have been nice yeah. to say X and Bell win. Yeah. But then who the hell was I? Nobody knew who I was. Eventually we did, but he's always been the much superstar. more, he was much more of a great driver than I ever was. That's fine. But, and he got recognition because he did what he did in F1. And I mean, you know, he did that amazing race at Spa that Brian Redman will tell you yeah. about, and, you know, in the, in the GT And he car. was so far ahead after one lap that yeah. they, they, they thought they'd all stopped. They all stopped. 40, yeah. Brian Tosler, 40. he was 45 seconds ahead at the end of the first the lap. The first lap at Spa, yeah, in the rain. Maybe the best lap anyone's ever done, yeah. kind of thing, in the rain. But he, 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 was, he was a brilliant young driver. I mean, just, um, he was outstanding, but he was also very young, I guess, in the days that... Um, Younger drivers were starting to be younger. Do you know yeah, what I'm yeah, saying? Yeah, totally. Sorry, I'm just and doing course, this guy. So, so he did a he did a heck of a lot for, for for younger people coming into racing. But there again, there's an interesting story. As I said, we said earlier, is where did he come from? Yeah, you know, he came from trials. He was the well, no, leave yeah, no. the European. And you jury. can imagine he's going to be amazing at that. He was yeah, amazing. That's right. But um, getting back to the others, I mean, I think of, of, of Ronnie Peterson, and uh, I thought was. I thought he had a unique talent. I'll never forget Ronnie drifting through corners, going in sideways. He was just, and on top of that, he was so, it was actually a sort of a humble, shy guy. And um, actually I got a fantastic photograph of Sever, and he, both wearing their helmets, Sever and Ronnie talking, and I'm talking, I'm in yeah, the middle yeah, talking. Yeah. Oh. And it was lovely, I found it some weeks ago, somebody sent it. And I go, I was so lucky to know them because yeah. they were in a, they were in that little echelon higher than me. Yeah. And I respect that. Um, but you drove, and, had Emerson. some amazing races. Of them. course. I mean, but we all did. You yeah, could, yeah. you know, I can never tell how good the cars were. Yeah. 
but I just I did I beat them on several occasions in yeah. those early days but then I look back and say yeah but I'd already done I was a year ahead yeah. of them yeah but I don't know if they looked like that when they were others were yeah. beating me and they'd say yeah but Derek was a year behind in his experience yeah I never read that you know no, you, you never read that side of their no, perspective the, I'm sure no. they were but back to being but whatever it didn't matter I wasn't looking for an accolade and I don't think any of us do but I mean I think the way Ronnie was just a natural flair and to see him you go and, and Jock and Rint was the same. He just, I mean, just full opposite locks and drifting, but the cars suited themselves yeah. to that. Yeah. I liked driving a little bit like that. I couldn't drive a side yeah. as they did. Yeah. And Sever was up there with them. Perhaps he perhaps didn't like the car as sideways he, because he was much more of a Formula One driver, <coughs> although he did drive sports yeah. cars. But Ronnie drove the Ferraris and stuff. Yeah. You know, I, he, I mean, he was yeah. my first run at Le Mans was with Ronnie in a 512 Ferrari. Isn't that great? So, you, every one of those three. Yeah. had no other life after yeah. that yeah. they're just frozen in time yeah that's uh, they they were frozen fell off they were yeah. they their mark on this world was mm. was was cemented at that moment yes. it was an imprint there's yes. no there was no following story no. i i've actually often thought about them because i know stefan's velos why girlfriend well, went on to yes. stay marry someone in racing and yes. you see yeah. her around yes. over the yes, years right. yes. and you see her with Porsche all yeah the time. but who but they all had, they had got maybe wives, kids, yes. girlfriends, yes. you know, uh, for whom their life totally stopped yeah, in yeah. the moments that yeah. they died. And we know nothing about no, no. the less, the, the story no. was not written no. any longer than that. No, and it's like Rolf Stormman. I mean, he was another one who was brilliant. And a, an outstanding driver, the best driver I've ever seen in a 935. Really? And I raced with him yeah. towards the end of his life. I was lucky enough to be put with him, presumably because I was quite a good driver to drive with yeah. him and I was quite handy. But I mean, you know, I was there, you know, the day, um, was I there? Yeah, the day he died. Where yeah, was it was that? my teammate, Riverside, California. And he, he well, didn't you just get out of the car? Yeah, I just he... got out and he went out in the first lap. He, I don't know why, but I think they put new tires on, which they always did at a pit stop, <clears throat> six hour race, I think. And um, the, the, the edges of the track, I mean, it's a track that was used two or three times a year. It was bloody awful. Lovely layout. Mm. But if you went off the road, it was just sand dunes. And the yeah. sand got rock hard. And where it rained, it used to run in rivulets through the, through the snow and uh, through the sand and make yeah, yeah. big sort of grooves where it came back to run across the track, the rain. And of course, you know, you didn't go off the road because you would knock the crap out of the yeah. car. And he went out on new tyres and it appears at one of the corners on his opening lap. I'd, I'd handed the car to him in the lead. Well, I think he'd led it in the first stint. Then I did a stint and then he did a stint. And I think he, he it appears he went off onto the rut, like rumble strips, which are rut, mm. but they weren't in those days. They were just holes, clank, clank, clank. Yeah. And we, and, um, Cut the tire. And we had, we had, no, we had this problem with the back, the wing on the back. It was a Moby Dick, but that's it right there. And the Moby, the Silverstone car, yeah. and that was a Moby Dick, and um, very narrow. It's built to do 215 at Le Mans, so it had very wonderful aerodynamics, but it wasn't yeah. built to go around corners. And so, of course, unfortunately, the team decided it was would run that car at Riverside, very quick in a straight line, but you had to get out of corners. And of course, he went into the next corner, and the bloody tail flew off. So, uh, so that was that. And he died. But talk. I mean, no one will ever ask you these things because your generation never talk about them but part of this <coughs> my thinking you know what I think about in the in the night or whatever you know, on a plane is the moments in between right everyone knows that but you were in the pits mm. his his sunglasses might have been sitting there but, from when he you had to go <coughs> back into the truck and change yeah, after I never yeah. Do you, you know that, what I'm saying in Rolf, I know that that's a very good point but we never knew I never knew that Rolf had died until Fitzy, John Fitzpatrick, told, he said to me, I, the other, I was with Rolf, Fitzpatrick was with Tim Schenkin or yeah. David Hobbs, I'm not sure which, I thought it was Schenkin, but I have a feeling David Hobbs was there. And I remember um, Fitzy came up to me and he, I got out of the car, as you know, yeah. and then Rolf took over and then he went off and he, Fitz, I know, because we didn't know what had happened, but it was pretty major. And Fitz came, he said, I've got to go to the hospital okay. and stuff. So I said, he said, will you take over my car? So I yeah. took over his car. And Schenken and I won the race. Yeah. And uh, I don't think we've got that recorded anywhere, but I did. And um, and then John came back, and on the, he came back from the hospital because it was an hour later. And he said, "Well, I don't think he'd gone past when he went to the medical unit." Yeah. 
And he came back and he said, Rolf's dead. By then the race was over and we had won. And it was like, oh my, and I just cried. I bet you did. But what you don't sort of, what you don't understand, well you do, but one doesn't understand that when you've been racing at such a high pitch, four, six hours or whatever, mm. 24, whatever it is, uh, the emotion at the end of a race is quite intense yeah. and you sort of can cry on that yeah, slowly down left, as yeah, you probably yeah. know. And um, th that day, sort of, A, we won, which was, you know, for a, was very short-lived as far as the, the excitement and got back in and then Fitzy came in and you just tell them something wrong. And he told us then, and uh, that just broke it up because there was, you know, sort of this kit on the counter, as you yeah. said, but, um, you know, that was it. What Crazy. can you say? Really? Was just who, who affected you the most out of all those? Like for me, I wasn't <clears> with him. I mean, obviously, Paul Warwick died in one of my yeah, second year I know, racing, and I, I was, and I, so. having just seen him on the grid. Yeah, I know. That was kind of. And you were younger. I was 18. Me. Yeah, you know, so 19. So that was yeah, crazy. Yeah. yeah. Um, but when Stefan died, because mm. I'd just started racing and yes. I was at the race with you, yes. I yes. remember thinking that was like, if someone that good could mm. could yeah. die and he was young, mm. it was. Mm. And as you once said, that was not really. He didn't need to go that day. Yeah. That was there was no need for him to do no. what he did. No. No, I. But that's how we raced. But that was it. Then you get back to his youth and exuberance. And you get the fact that he was just going quicker and quicker. Although we were, I think, quite substantially, like three minutes yeah. in the lead, because I just handed over to him yeah. after his initial very, very fast stints. And he was outrageously good. Mm -hmm. But I remember thinking, wouldn't it be a good idea just to steady him up now? We've got a three minute lead going into an hour to the end or something. I don't know yeah. when it was. And, um, you know, they just said, isn't he brilliant? And that was it, really. I, and I was terribly disappointed because I. I had a very special place for him, and remember, I was now getting older. And you was, probably felt like you were mentoring. Well, him. I was. Yeah. Well, he used to call me father, and I've called yeah, him yeah. son. And um, I, you know, I, and I didn't look at the name. It was Belloff was the name on which was Bell and Off and yeah. Belloff. So our, our pit board said that, <clears throat> and I just I really liked him, adored mm. him in a, in a way because I felt he was my son, like yeah, a son yeah, yeah, in, yeah. in racing terms, and. Um, you know, I didn't think it should have happened, and I, I always felt that somebody should have got hold of him and said, hold on, sunshine, yeah. I think you're going a bit too quick. Now, anybody listening to whatever we're saying, right, I'll say, well, why didn't you, Derek? But the problem was, remember, I was, whatever, 45, and he was 25, uh, I think something like that, for example, <clears throat> and, um, and he was on the way up and, and, and definitely on his way in, well into Formula One and material to be world champion, obviously, but nobody got hold of him to guide him. And I was always disappointed that that hadn't happened. And it might well have been to me to say it, but if I had said something to him uh, and he had got, and he'd got in, not to the press, what he had said, well, even, well, Derek Bell said I should calm down a bit, which I should have done. He wouldn't have taken any bloody notice, but he might have said, really? And I know that there's others, people I know today, that I could probably talk to and say, hey, you know, you're bloody brilliant. Like, uh, but, you know, like they're saying to Verstappen, you know, you should actually just knock it back a bit. Um, you've got plenty of time ahead of you to become mm. the greatest thing in the world. And Stefan did too. But I don't think anybody said that to him. And I, so I, I don't blame anybody. I just blame the, the situation. Yeah. <coughs> okay. yeah. I, uh, I was just thinking, as you said that, that the, uh, when everything's going well and everyone wants you to be the fastest, that's the teams, mm -hmm. there are teams that that's all the team yes, wants you to do. Yes. And they actually are, there's a lot taken out of a driver. Yes. Right. I mean, and then it made me think about Enzo. And when I talked to, I don't know, you, I think this will be the first podcast I put up, um, of this series, but so we won't have heard the Stephanie Hansen one, yeah. but he, I, I talk about with him about um, uh, Mr. Ferrari, yeah. and he said he was he was a, a funnier, much more compassionate man than anyone really realised. He was had a great sense of humour, yeah. but the only side you hear is how his approach to drivers, <coughs> and yeah. he was and he was so it was just about winning. And I think you were in an era when 
we, there was no track safety, there was no driver safety, there was all yeah. shit really, yeah. wasn't yeah. it? Nobody you, knew any different. No one knew any different, and you guys didn't. You were mm. gladiators running around with swords, and they, you didn't know that mm. it wasn't really, it was, it was as good as it got in your opinion. Um, but the teams must take it, they never talk about it, but whether it's a David Price or it's the team manager that was on the radio with him, or it was, it's a hell of a burden to carry. Yes. Right? I mean, uh, Beaky Sims, you know, when you talked to him and he was there with Jim Clark, I mean, yeah. a, f a fucking burden to carry. Yes. That you know you were the last guy to cinch up his seatbelts. Yes, and, right, yeah. you know, I, I uh, and he's a guy I would like to talk to as well yes. because his, those, those last few hours mm. and, you know, what he went through and mm. then after. Mm. Mm. Um, but I remember Sterling saying about going to funerals, you know, mm. he, mm. I asked him about it, Sterling Moss, and he was, mm. you know, he, he said it was, a, it was kind of part of it. Yes. And it's in the way it was for fighter pilots. Yes. And he was even more, you know, him being ahead of you. Yeah. Quite, yeah. quite something, isn't it? Yeah. I'm glad that historic <laughs> cars, seeing cars like all these cars with these guys' names on is yes. keeping it alive. Yes. Historic yeah, racing, historic is, racing is keeping it alive. Otherwise, their names would, would have gone. Because they didn't have names on cars back in the 50s. Uh, shit, did yeah. Did they? And you think about no. it. No, that's what's so great about this lot. You know, and if you're at, at some time off camera, Lily, but you should have a chat with um, um, Henry Pym because yeah. he's behind this thing, which I, mean, I get the letters wrong, but it's really, it's, it's making classic historic car racing stick there and it's like an association yeah, yeah, yeah. to promote the future of classic yeah. historic cars to be, you know and having people put money into yeah. it to to keep all these cars going for the future because it is you a know, legacy, they, when it? it gets electric it ain't gonna be much it's there i'm afraid that i can see at the moment but no. i i don't think electric will stay there they're always going to be racing there's, there's going to it's be going racing. to drift off to something hydrogen and but and all that sort of thing and that's but I do thing. think we're in a glory area about yeah. to come up I yeah. think the next fire I thought that at Le Mans last year when you were Grand Marshal or this year right but and I was thinking and I said it to John Duna Imsa I think we should treat 2023 onwards as yeah. a pretty special yeah. five year yeah, yeah. maybe three to five year because arguably it'll be the last hey there'll be other heydays yes. But for anything with an internal combustion mm. engine, even though they're going to have yeah. hybrid engines, yeah. I think it's it can only be as with the manufacturer by and can only be as good as it's going to yes. be yes. in that in yes. the next five years. Yes. I think everything with that you know the nine six two behind you and all the nine thirty pies and things, it's the last throwback yes. to those because it will change. Yes, you know yes. the world will not allow us to race. No, I know to race the way the cars know. the way we know. I mean, like yeah. Formula E is it's great, but like I said, someone asked me, you know, what do you think of electric race cars and I go it's, it's great but it's yeah. like watching porn with the sound off yes you know what I mean it's, it's everything's happening but it's yeah. not it's not There's the no same action. is it yeah no no atmosphere no atmosphere no. um quickly as I realized that we uh, we'll probably end up, over the years have to do more than one of these just because there's so much to talk about and I like we got grandpa to talk about the colonel and but uh, the Enzo thing is good yes. I you haven't have you seen House of Gucci yet yes Yes. So I thought it was a great movie, yes, right? I, yes. But I thought about him and yes. you while I was watching it, because there was a elegance and a yes. class and a detail to that sixties and seventies. Yes. And again, it, the the big moments are recorded, but the little ones <clears throat> aren't. And when you tell the story of like how he pick you up for dinner in his little mm. car, because you know he probably had, was he smoking? Did he have? A, did yeah, he get? Yeah. You know what was what was he yeah, know, like in amazing. those intimate yeah. moments? I mean. How many people did that? I don't Not know. everyone you did. See, I don't know. I don't think they did. Because I never hear anybody talking that much about him like that. I never yeah. heard Mario talking about it. But I'm sure he did. You see, Mario would go there, I would imagine, as IndyCar champion and a big star. I went there as like this yeah. wide open, open eyed, wide mouth sort of, yeah. what am I doing here? You know, and, and that sort of hum more. But he humble. liked you. He seemed he to. He seemed to, right? Yeah. Because he spent time. She didn't yeah. need to spend he time with you. He didn't need to spend time. No, we went out together. On so he'd come and pick you up for dinner? He yeah, he'd come in the, Well, his secretary would phone me up and, uh, sort of during the day and you know, staying at the yeah. Ralph Finney Hotel or whether I was, because we didn't have cell phones. And he'd, he or she would, would phone up and say, you know, tonight, not will you, tonight you will have dinner with El Commander Tori. And I go, oh my God, really? Okay. Like, do I have to? Yeah, yeah. Because I had to struggle to speak French, which I couldn't very well then. So you spoke to him in French? Had, yeah, because he wouldn't speak English. Yeah. I swear he spoke English. You told me that when we went in yeah. and saw him. 
Well, he always had, I mean, you think about it, Mike Hawthorne, he had Mike Parks, he had, um, I mean, who the hell else? He had British speaking yeah. drivers, you would have thought, Peter Collins, you would have thought um, he would have spoken a bit yeah. for English. But um, I think his feeling was, if you want to speak to me, speak to me in my language or what I want. But we spoke very openly in French, but I didn't speak it very well. And I that often when I talk about him, you know, what arrive at the restaurant, we would get out of the car and he would open the door for me to walk in in front of him, like I was his new boy, and um, which I was. Yeah. And um, but it was amazing walking to restaurants, and I was I, I mean there was me walking with El, en, Enzo Ferrari into the Gatto Verdi up in the hills and one day you must try and go there because yeah. I think it's still there above Marinello and I mean it's just um, amazing to walk in with him but I never thought about I'm Derek Bell and I'm with Enzo no. Ferrari I just walked like Christ yeah. you know I mean I wasn't I was in awe but I wasn't I was like actually I was almost like I was in a sort of a void of sort of where am I going yeah. and what's this all about and you know we'd go in and I remember that night I drove him home you know because he's Papino, that was his right God, I remember the name now. Papino was his riding mechanic that he used to have back in the Alfa Romeo days. And Papino was still his uh, sort of driver, chauffeur, when he wanted driving, particularly or dropping off somewhere. And Papino had dropped him, I think I'm right in saying this to him, he dropped him off at um, the, di the re one particular restaurant. Uh, he'll meet me there. So I drove up, it was at the Gatto Verdi again, and um, we used to go there more frequently, I suppose. And uh, so I drove over my Fiat 124, like a <laughs> rental car. And when it came to leave, he said, uh, you, you will, you will you drive me home? I went, oh God, I've got to drive Enzo. I mean, yeah. what's the hell, the hell do I drive Enzo in a Fiat 124? So of course it's a real twisty mountain. It seems to me like it was a mountain road. I'd love to go up to it again. Um, and uh, I sort of remember I, he got in the car. I mean, I'm driving Enzo Ferrari for God's sake. Yeah. There were no cameramen taking pictures of him or anything. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's unbelievable when you think about it. And um, I just drove him home and I thought, well, do I drive fast? And he thinks, oh, well, well, this is something else and probably fall off the road. Or do I drive slowly? And he goes, God, no wonder this guy's not very quick. Yeah. I don't know. But he, 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 generally speaking, he was always very yeah. reasonable to me and polite. And as I say, every morning when I was there, he would say, in the beginning, he'd say, well, the whole time, actually, uh, how's your wife today? Because Pam, yeah, yes, you your mum, was very ill in hospital in England. And I'd say, well, I haven't phoned the hospital yet because it was 8 o'clock in England, mm. 9 o'clock in Italy, and it's a bit early because all the rounds are going on then. He said, let's phone now because now wow. it's 10 o'clock. So he would phone his secretary, say, phone the hospital, and he would. And then you know, chat with, or chat with a nurse or yeah. something. Her mum was. I mean, it was amazing. That was so. Hard. But the Ferrari are very, very um, family orientated people. Very, I reckon to this well, day, it, it's anyone that drives, it's, it's, Italians are. Yeah. yeah, they love their family. I, that was. I mean, that's mm. that was the. Uh, I was oblivious to. Mm. Obviously, I was so young when you. I was just mm. born, um, and when mum was in hospital, but. It shows that that was a very impactful time in both your lives. Because uh, mum will talk about it from her point of view. Yeah, yeah. I mean, when you had her, your mum and her mum, right? What did in they the say? In the kitchen. In the kitchen? I wa yeah, I, I mean, I came in, I was, I, I, I'm just trying to think, it was 68, so. I'd just been born. Yeah. Well, I was, and then mum got sick again after I was born. That's right. Well, that's, yeah, well she got sick for the first time after, but she wasn't yeah. sick before. Oh, okay. Yeah. That, she, you know, she was sick following your you know, it's sort of whatever it did, it damaged her yeah. from your birth. But Lord, it was later that year. What yeah? You know, what year was it? Again? February sixty eight. Yeah, this was in now uh, May, or during that yeah. ensuing period. As far as I remember, she would yeah. know better. But I thought it. And um, anyway, so um, I remember I went. You know, we, we'd got your mum was in hospital and she was under control, but we were all very worried. And I would, when I was, I'd always go to see her. Basically, I mean, I remember driving to, obviously into Chichester, but eventually I was going to King Edward's Hospital in London, big bloody hospital. Yeah. I used to drive up there, the dingy bloody, oh. gruesome hot, uh, hospital. I'm thinking of King Edward's, yeah. Yeah, no, King Edward's was at that Midhurst, was but this was still grim. It, it, it's almost like Edwardian yeah, English. It really hospital, was Edwardian, yeah. big, austere, sombre building. And it was, I mean, it was all, you know, dark corridors and the smell of hospitals. And, so. and that, that smell's always stuck with me. And Mum was sitting there as bright and breezy in bed as she could be. Yeah. She always bothered so much. And um, 
anyway, I remember um, I came, I, you know, was carrying on my life in the normal way. Mum was, and she was probably down up. She wasn't in London at this point, and and she, anyway, she was certainly in hospital. And um, I remember I came back also from somewhere, and from down on the farm or yeah. whatever it was, and walked into the house at the White House on Aubrey Avenue in Bolton. And Pam, Mum's mother, was there. And uh, I walked in, and my because it was, I guess it was only early afternoon, maybe it was late afternoon, doesn't matter. Really. But I know it was daylight, very bright, lovely day. And I came in feeling sort of bright, bright coloured, yeah. and I, you know, sort of hopped in, because, probably because, you know, we knew Mum was recovering, and, you know, it was yeah. like the, the, the drama, or the worst part of it seemed yeah. to be over. And, uh, and, I, and I came in, and, and I remember they both stood there holding their gin and tonics and drinking, smoking their cigarettes. And my, mother, uh, and my mother looked at me and she said, we've just had a telex has come through from, from Shell to here, uh, asking you to go back out and sign your contract in Italy. And before I had a chance to go, whoa, like that, she, mother, she said, uh, to go out to Italy, she said, and if you, if you sign that contract, you'll never walk in this house again. Your own mother? My own mother, in front of her mother, I went. And of course, her mother was naturally very pro her, as she should be. It was her lovely yeah. daughter, and she was very worried, as she should be. But of course, it was the old gin and tonics and the, Hitting the, and the sherries that had had oh, all that. Oh. And I went, oh my God. And of course, to me, and probably would have been to you, it's like, that's the end that's of the my best. world. Because yeah. I, I can't carry on. I can't not come home. Yeah. And uh, I remember that night, anyway, so that's right, she was in Chichester, because I went, I went from, later on that day, I went off, you know. I mean, the conversation didn't really go any further. I just was like, okay. No, so, I don't know what I did. I don't know how the conversation finished, but I got the message. And so I then went off to the hospital to see her in the evening, and she was sitting up in bed, all looking bright and breezy. She said, how are you? I said, well, I was, basically. I said, yeah, but it's the best news of my life a minute yeah, ago. That's right, I, I'd just been, so she, I said, um, I said, I, I, yeah, so I said, well, she said, why, what's wrong? I said, well, Ferrari just sent a telex saying, would I go in and, and sa go out to Italy and sign my contract? And she said, uh, and my mother just looked at me and told me the story, which I just related. And uh, she said, oh my God, don't be ridiculous. How could you possibly do that? And I give her, I mean, but you see, I give her full marks and always yeah. did for that because she could have said, yeah, you're bloody right. Yeah. But what she didn't world? blame it on me. Yeah. They were trying to blame, find somebody to blame her illness on. Yeah. And of course, in those days particularly, well, like a lot of things, as you well know, with all these things that go on, it's anxiety. Yeah. And so they're saying it was the anxiety of having you, the, you know, the stress of having yeah. a child and me racing cars. And that combined with possibly a weakness somewhere in her system. Yeah than what it did. Thank know. God she, I mean, yeah, you think about that, you you probably wouldn't have stopped, but you would have turned down that contract, which would have set off a chain of events well, that would have I was never going to get another job you. in it. I'd yeah. have to go back to running the farm. Can you imagine the bloody rows no. we would have had? No, no doubt. It was, yeah. it would have been awful. So. I, um, yeah, isn't that weird? Mm. And then, uh, uh, and then you think how you're, career unfolded from there and if you hadn't have had Ferrari it's funny as you said Ferrari was at so early on yeah. and then we're not doing a bibliography of your career but it's you when you took me down there when I was 17 I was 18 just starting racing and we went and met him Enzo um, and we walked in the, the year uh, before he died year before he died that's why you wanted to do it I, and he gave remember I said you got a tie I said uh, got your tie. I got my tie and I got my key fob somewhere yeah. in a box but do you remember he asked you? A, you had told me he, he remember you know watch out for your English you yes. know because I think he understands at least more, and his consigliere was there yeah. as well. Yes. And he had the crystal head of the horse, you know the crystal yeah, horse. The, crystal was, the, horses, the horse's head was the here, and, horse, yeah. and I remember it was very dramatic. And I remember thinking, and he looked at me and he said, "What about you?" And I said, "Well, uh, my dad was the last. My father was the last." A British driver to race for Ferrari in Formula One, and I want to be the next. I remember I said that, yeah. and he just went, "Bene, tutto bene." bene. You he know, said, uh, "Very words." He said, "We, ha I have been watching." Oh, that's amazing. Or words we have been watching. Yeah. 
of course it didn't happen but it was but then he gave me the key ring yeah, and that right. thing how amazing well now we get we we've talked ages but there's so much to talk about i know there's, it's, it's just it's a, a lot of years, a, it? lot of years and, <laughs> but it's the people if you look back yeah. what a life well led i mean we sterling and i mean all that oh, we haven't been into you haven't that. even got into him and you know it's my it's, hero you know from my totally from child yeah he, it's astonishing isn't it, it is actually there's so much to talk about but you know there's my inspiration for all this is not it's not the big moments it's like the little moments mm. it's the moments yes. that no one else only you were yeah, there that's right yes. right there's no yes. unless i know yes, with yes, those yes. eyes you know which yeah. you've seen in your hands and mm. and uh and then the car behind that's so called so yeah when you oh united that together it's amazing yeah, to yeah. Have that was the highlight of the last 10 years it Jesus, was wasn't it to yes. drive this to win the historic race and yeah i know it's so silent sitting behind you yeah amazing. but it was so the history in that well, okay. vibrant and yeah it was amazing it's what just, dad love you lots that was so cool you. bless you thanks do it again. thank yeah